Welcome everyone to this afternoon session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we'll be exploring a recent book by the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum's Teasel Muir Harmony, entitled Operation Moonglow, A Political History of Project Apollo, published last November by Basic Books. Joining us for the discussion today is Asif Siddiqui, Professor of History at Fordham University. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my colleague, Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center. He'll be introducing the, the authors and comment, author and commentator and moderating today's discussion. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times in person at the Wilson Center, since pandemic restrictions, yes, which are lifting slowly here in the virtual realm. Today's session, I'm delighted to add, is being co-sponsored by the Wilson Center's Science and Technology Innovation Program, which produces and collaborates on research, articles, and events with industry and government about critical space policy issues from cybersecurity to education. We have a continuing lineup of sessions, five more actually, still ahead of us this season, that'll carry us into late July, including a session this coming Monday, June 28th at 4 p.m., when we discuss Patricia Sullivan's just published book, Justice Rising, Robert Kennedy's America in Black and White. Please join us for that session, as well as today's. Behind the scenes, there are two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And we'd like to thank the financial supporters of the seminar, both anonymous and not anonymous. And as always, we invite you to join their ranks. Information about doing so can be found in the chat. On the logistics front, please note today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function um, or the Q&A function on Zoom. Those watching on Facebook Live can email questions to Rachel Wheatley, whose email address is posted in the chat function. With that, I turn the screen over to Christian Osterman, who will introduce today's speakers. Christian, screen's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, from me as well to this Washington History Seminar. I'm delighted to introduce our uh, two panelists and then moderate the discussion. And we'll start with uh, the author um, uh, today. Teasel Muir Harmony is a curator at the, of the Apollo Collection at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. She earned her PhD from MIT's Program in History, Anthropology, Science, and Technology and Society. Dr. Mia Harmony is the author of uh, Apollo to the Moon, A History in 50 Objects, published in 2018. And of course, uh, Operation Moonglow, A Political History of Project Apollo, published just last year, which we'll discuss today. She's also a co-editor and contributor to a special issue of the Pacific Historical Review on Science and Technology in Japanese-US relations, published in 2019, and advisor to the television series Apollo's Moonshot. She co-organizes the Space Policy and History Forum, serves on the Executive Council of the Society of the History of Technology, and teaches at Georgetown University's Science, Technology, and International Affairs program. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to the Washington History Seminar. Congratulations on your book, and uh, we're all ears. Zoom room is yours. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. It's uh, a true pleasure. I've been a, an attendee of this seminar for many years, and um, it's one of the great joys of living in Washington. So, and, and um, I'm just pretty thrilled to be able to share my work with you today. And uh, thank you in advance to ASIF for um, providing comments and, and reading my book and, and uh, your questions in advance. So um, I'll just start off with an extremely short summary of the book and then dive into it in a little bit more depth. So I boiled it down to one, one sentence, which is this book is about why the moon landing was a truly global event and why it matters. Um, and uh, I'll start off by telling you a bit about how I came to this project. So 
A number of years ago, I was doing research at the National Archives in College Park um, on a completely different project. It was on um, science diplomacy, but I was looking at an American observatory in Japan in the 1950s. And I, I wanted to learn more about the, the larger context of the role of US science in Japan at that time. I had some extra hours in my day. I'd already gotten through the boxes that I had requested. So I requested a few more somewhat outside the scope of that project. And, um, and that's when I found this story that would really transform how I understood this relationship between science power and globalization. And um, the, the boxes I requested were part of the State Department records. And I read a report that was dated September 4th, 1962. And it described an exhibit at a department store in downtown Tokyo of the Friendship 7 spacecraft. So this is the spacecraft that John Glenn used to orbit the Earth. This is the first American orbital space flight. And um, the report noted that over 500,000 people saw this spacecraft during this four day long exhibit. So this is a very shocking number. Um, so I'm a curator at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. This, we're one of the most popular museums in the world. And um, on our best days in July, when we're open and uh, there are a lot of people coming through, we, can, we might get 100,000 people, a little over 100,000 people. So 500,000 people in four days is an incredible number for an exhibit. And this was a crowd to see just one spacecraft, um, really quite remarkable. So I read on and um, the report described several hundred police and guides that had to channel a crowd up nine flights of stairs in this department store. They zigzagged them across the roof and brought them down nine flights of stairs again to walk past the spacecraft. And I had realized that John Glenn's flight was, was important within American history, um, within space history, but I, I wanted to understand more about its significance in Japan and why people would come and wait in line for hours just to walk by this spacecraft. And I also wondered if this document hinted at something larger and something more fundamental about the ties of space flight and foreign relations. And so I continued to look into the story um, and uh, I soon discovered that this record breaking event in Tokyo was no chance event and it wasn't the only event um, of its kind and its exhibit was part of an international tour that was called the fourth orbit so this is a bit of a humorous title for this exhibit so um, John Glenn orbited the Earth three times in a spacecraft, and so uh, this international diplomatic tour of the spacecraft was the fourth time the spacecraft would um, orbit the Earth. Um, but it was a, it was a hugely popular event, um, drew an incredible um, audience. So it visited over twenty cities. It was seen by roughly four million people, and then another twenty million people watched television programs broadcast from exhibit sites. This was the first large scale U.S. space diplomacy program of its kind, and. Um, and the stories from each exhibit site are uh, are just fascinating to read. People um, waiting in line for hours, uh, museums having to stay open late. Um, there was so much enthusiasm to see the spacecraft. Um, and I quickly learned that this popular exhibit was part of a much larger, more extensive U.S. initiative um, tied to Cold War grand strategy. And um, although historians um, of of have been have increasingly been looking at the role of science and technology and technological systems as forms of political power, especially during the Cold War. The cultural history of science and technology diplomacy, like exhibits, um, like this, the Friendship 7 spacecraft tour, um, have received far less attention. Um, and then also similarly, um, historians who look at cultural diplomacy have, have done incredible work focused on um, jazz and dance and art, but science and technology tend to be absent um, from many of these studies or, or play a minor role. So one of the things that I really wanted to do with this project was to bring the cultural status of science and technology to the foreground um, of the history of foreign relations. And so this project really lies at the intersection of the history of science and technology, foreign relations history, cultural history, and the history of the US and the world. And I start my book off in the 1950s with early discussions of satellites and their potential impact on national prestige and international alliances, um, when there's this idea that US power relied on positive perceptions of the United States. And um, in this section, I make a point of emphasizing how domestic and international politics were deeply intertwined when it came to Americans, the American space program, um, and that also, the political, social, and cultural implications 
of the Soviet satellite Sputnik did not just fall into place on their own in 1957, um, but the important role played by um, especially politicians within Washington, D.C., who took an active hand in molding the meaning and impact of Sputnik. So Lyndon Johnson's a great example of this. He called for a congressional investigation. Um, he used Sputnik to become the congressional space expert and as a stepping stone to the presidential nomination in 1960. Um, he likened Sputnik to Pearl Harbor or the Alamo. And so these were not just attempts to interpret the significance of Sputnik, they're about making it significant. Um, and I make the point of how we think about Sputnik today um, and how we draw on the idea that Sputnik shocked the nation um, into action. Um, and even the way we talk about how you know, a Sputnik moment, we need a Sputnik moment to, to um, inspire us to innovate uh, today has a direct lineage to LBJ and others politicking. Um, and that this is true throughout the space age. So there's an incredible amount of work that went into framing the meaning of spaceflight to serve political ends. Um, and I, in my book, I co cover a variety of ways that this happens. It's a common th theme throughout my book. Um, and it's, I find it important not only because it illuminates the contingency of this Sputnik moment, but tells us about how and why spaceflight assumed the national priority status it did in 1961. So then I move on to um, the Kennedy administration, really important to the Apollo story, um, uh, and point out that during the transition from Eisenhower to Kennedy, um, the, the future of space exploration was quite unclear. Both Eisenhower and Kennedy were skeptical of human spaceflight. Um, there were studies undertaken um, to determine the cost of, of sending humans to the moon. Um, both Eisenhower and Kennedy thought that um, it wasn't worth the cost, especially not at that moment. Um, so Kennedy initially said he would put off that decision till later. But things changed quite quickly in the spring of 1961, um, and there are two very important events for that change. Uh, with Yuri Gagarin's flight, this is the Soviet Union achieved the first human space flight, um, and public opinion polls um, and analysis of public opinion noted that for international audiences, well, while Sputnik may have shocked and surprised the world, Gagarin's flight really um, impressed them, and that, that might actually be um, uh, politically more concerning for the United States that the world was impressed by, by, by Gagarin's flight. And then in short succession, there was the failure at the Bay of Pigs, the CIA-backed invasion. So both of these were blows to U.S. prestige, and, and Kennedy um, saw the need to uh, find a program which promised dramatic results, which the United States could win. And those were his instructions um, to Lyndon Johnson. Um, he was initially open to other types of programs. He didn't necessarily think it had to be space exploration, but it became clear quite quickly that the United States would have to in invest in um, a large scale, impressive um, space program. And uh, Johnson, uh, consulted with the experts of the day, um, met with members of Congress, ensured that um, uh, a program would, would pass in Congress, and um, they, they settled on this goal of sending humans to the moon before the end of the decade, uh, landing them there and returning them safely back to Earth. And um, Kennedy proposes this to a joint session of Congress in uh, May 1961. And um, what I do in my book, and what I think is really important to emphasize is this is um, the, the context of this proposal um, and, and also this context of the speech. And so um, this, this address, the joint session of Congress is about 30 minutes long. Uh, and if you've ever heard any of it, you've probably heard the last few minutes where he proposes Project Apollo, it's the most famous part, um, but it's a 30 minute speech and um, he lays out why um, the United States would should do something like send humans to the moon. It, he lays out this larger context. And so he talks about, he starts off by talking about um, that there's a battle taking place in the lands of the rising people, um, Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East, um, and that there was a um, global revolution. Um, he talked about how the U.S. had to steer the trajectory of this global revolution. And so part of what he's talking about is um, decolonization. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, colonial powers uh, 
ruled much of Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and the Middle East. Um, but after World War II, the um, world order was upended um, and um, European powers were left bereft, uh, propelled the US and Soviet Union to superpower status. And there was a wave of independence movements. Um, uh, and between 1945 and 1970, the number of new nations increased fourfold. So um, this is a, an important part of this context of Project Apollo and this changing world order, um, and that the US and the Soviet Union competed to create a global coalition aligned with their respective ideologies. So for the US, the world democracy, for the Soviet Union, communism. Um, and it's also important, and, and what's covered in the speech is the introduction of nuclear weapons, which upended how wars were waged. And so the US was investing in proxy wars and backing coups, um, but also invested more in soft power rather than coercive force. And this nuclear stalemate really elevated the significance of propaganda and psychological strategy. So um, things like symbolism and rhetoric, ideas, images, um, they assumed a new political potency. Um, and, and then eventually after, after 25 minutes, um, Kennedy proposes Project Apollo. And he proposes it in a very particular way, which I find um, important to point out. And he talks about the battle going on around the world between freedom and tyranny. And he said that spaceflight was affecting the men's of mind who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. And what he's talking about is whether or not they should pursue liberal democracy or communism. And so um, he's really setting out multiple goals here. So not just the goal of sending humans to the moon and returning them safely to earth, but also this goal of impacting the minds of men everywhere. Um, it makes it clear that this is part of the Apollo objective. Um, so spaceflight and the Apollo program in particular became a major national priority in the 1960s. And by the mid 1960s, over 4% of the federal budget went to sending humans to the moon, uh, drew on a workforce, of hundreds of thousands of people spread across the country and across the world. Um, at the time, uh, it, it cost $25 billion. Today, it's estimated that this, this effort um, involved in sending humans to the moon was about $280 billion um, in today, for today's. Um, um, and it's the equivalent of more than 18 times uh, what was spent on the Panama Canal, more than five times the expense of the Manhattan Project, and even more than the Eisenhower administration's interstate highway system. So the most expensive civilian technological program in history. Um, and it's worth noting that there are countless books written on Project Apollo. You could fill a library with them. Uh, the majority of them chronicle how the US sent humans to the moon. So the building of hardware and things like that, or um, the experience of astronauts. And there's also a great body of literature on the political history of space flight. And um, that really established that, that Kennedy supported an accelerated space program primarily as a foreign policy response to Soviet space accomplishments and their in impact on national prestige. Um, but what I wanted to know and what I explore in my book is how this project played out through the 1960s. Um, not just how the United States sent humans to the moon, but um, how did the US try to impact the minds of men everywhere? Um, what was involved in that goal? And so that's what I investigated in, in my book. Um, and so I have a large focus on the role of the US Information Agency and the State Department in particular. The US Information Agency was responsible for the um, uh, foreign public relations dimensions of the Apollo program. NASA uh, was, was responsible for, for domestic public relations, but when it came to um, engagement with international audiences, it was really up to the USIA um, and, and working in collaboration with the State Department. Um, and throughout the 1960s, they had um, film screenings, exhibits, um, distributed pamphlets and books, um, had radio programs, spacecraft tours, astronaut appearances, uh, handed out souvenirs and had press packets. Um, and they also didn't assume that there would be interest in spaceflight initially. They actively cultivated this global audience um, to get them interested and engaged in spaceflight um, at the same time as they built a global communications infrastructure that enabled hundreds of millions of people to follow spaceflight in unison. And um, an important part 
of the story that I tell uh, in my book is the evolution of this material over the course of the 1960s. Um, so the US government carefully and intentionally framed the meaning of Project Apollo for international audiences, um, and they continually refined it with an eye to how it best served foreign relations interests. So they adjusted the tone, the methods, um, and they wanted to make sure that spaceflight would um, have maximum um, value to US interests in various locations. And so I talk about how the meaning of Apollo was co-produced throughout this process of refinement um, through listening to audiences. And in the early 1960s, um, there was a focus on the demonstration of te technological, economic, and political superiority on the world stage. And um, it emphasized that the US was not um, in a space race, but uh, the US space program was part of a rational pursuit of knowledge, um, just like research in a laboratory. And there was an emphasis also on exhibiting hardware and a focus on science um, as universal, as well as a demonstration of American exceptionalism, sort of an interesting tension there. Um, but by the late 1960s, the emphasis had switched um, and the emphasis put um, spaceflight as a global accomplishment of all humankind. Um, and um, this was based on what was seen as, as um, having more potential impact. So an example of this, after the Apollo 8 mission, so this is the first time humans uh, flew to the moon, there's an orbital flight. Uh, there was a film created based on this, this flight and it was shown to audiences around the world. And uh, for a screening in Kenya, um, uh, American public diplomats watched the audience, watched the film. So this is quite common uh, and then reported back. And um, it's, they said that the um, whenever the film's narrator uh, included phrases like product of American skill and American sweat or the camera panned to close up of the flag or letters um, USA on a spacecraft, an embarrassed laugh would run through the audience. Um, so this, this commentary was taken into to account. This was part of the refinement to ensure that these films would be received well. They'd have their, their potential impact. And so um, uh, the role of the United States within its space program was actually downplayed quite a bit over the course of the 1960s. Um, and this is especially true of the first lunar landing. This is Apollo 11 in July 1969. And there were actually guidelines established to how uh, public diplomats should talk about Apollo. So clear um, guidance when it came to framing. So part of that was downplaying the role of the United States within the mission um, and uh, emphasizing that this was for all humankind and finding ways to make people feel like participants in spaceflight. Um, it also involved the establishment of a symbolic activities committee to ensure that the astronauts uh, could undertake activities on the moon that would um, symbolize this idea that the, the mission was for all humankind. So a lot of things were debated the idea of um, inviting poets from around the world to compose special poetry for the mission um, and then that would be brought to the moon and left there that was uh, decided against but one thing that they did do is they um, invited foreign leaders to um, uh, to to write messages that were then inscribed on a silicon disk and left on the moon um, ahead of the first uh, lunar landing, there was an incredible amount of work uh, that went into promoting um, that, that flight, getting people excited. So exhibits around the world, um, uh, working with local, local media really closely. Um, during my research, I was able to interview um, Eric Townberg, which was, he was referred to as the um, Norwegian Walter Cronkite. So he uh, was the voice of space in Norway and he and many other um, journalists were invited to the United States um, by the uh, US government. They were able to tour um, NASA facilities and meet with space experts within the United States. And then, and then they would uh, return home and be um, the local space experts um, in their respective countries. So. Um, it was a highly coordinated effort. Um, and during the 1960s, in addition to um, building up this um, uh, sort of enthusiasm for spaceflight through exhibits and um, all sorts of other programming, the US built up a global communications infrastructure. Um, it supported space missions um, through tracking and keeping the astronauts in touch with mission control but it also enabled a global audience to watch the first lunar, live, lunar landing live together on television. Um, 
And that's an important part of the experience of um, uh, the first lunar landing is this um, ability to watch it together around the world um, and to give you a sense of some of the effort that went into uh, ensuring this global audience. Um, in Venezuela, there was no satellite ground station to receive uh, television from the Intelsat satellite network. So the US government actually funded the transport of a ground station to Venezuela. Um, and uh, so that an audience of 1.5 million TV um, viewers could, could watch that first lunar landing in Venezuela and Colombia, making it the first international event seen live um, in that region. Um, so I know that I'm going on for far too long, so I'll just quickly say that uh, some important aspects of the, the first lunar landing, this was the, um, the largest uh, participated event in, in world history. Um, and uh, it was it was broadcast in many languages on television on radio over half the world's population was following that mission. And part of the experience of following the first lunar landing was an awareness that the whole world was doing it together and so. Um, when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin returned to Earth and they were in quarantine. Buzz Aldrin uh, was able to see some of the coverage and he, he turned to Neil Armstrong and he said we missed the whole thing, because part of what he saw was coverage of all the audiences around the world following the flight. Um, that was a big part of the story. So it wasn't just images of astronauts on the moon, it was images of audiences um, throughout the world participating in this event um, in unison. And that was part of that experience. So um, to end, I'll just, I'll say a few things um, about uh, what I hope to accomplish with my book. So that the Apollo program not only taught us about the formation of the moon and our solar system, um, but it had a tangible and immediate impact on US foreign relations. And I, I talk a bit about that. Um, but I, I also wanted to talk about another measure of its impact when it came to um, US foreign relations and, and history more generally. And um, it's reflected in, in public diplomats assessment of the first lunar landing. And in a report, they talk about a sense of unity that was brought about by Apollo 11 programming. They um, said that it was an emerging new dimension in the international political process. And they compared it to the experience of unity that might be expected to emerge from global disasters like a world uh, epidemic, a meteor collision or nuclear accident. Um, and that commentary around the world suggested a sense of um, participation in uh, the mission and a sense of solidarity of the human community. Um, and that above all else, there was this heightened awareness that um, the whole of mankind was sharing the emotions of a single experience. And uh, Apollo and all the associated programming was designed to tell a certain story about the values and strengths of liberal democracy. Um, so not only about the prestige of um, uh, America in the eyes of the world, but an, about an attempt to form a global community linked by shared experiences, um, shared language, like some of the rhetoric that was used in the promotion of Apollo and shared icons, like the images of Earthrise and other images that were distributed um, throughout the 1960s. And in my book, I discuss how this contributed to an increased awareness of global interconnection, which is um, an essential feature of the evolution of globalization at that time. Um, and I think it's a story that helps us understand the nature of power as well as the links between nationalism and globalism. So I'll end there and uh, I look forward to your questions and ask if I look forward to your comments. Thanks so much, Tizel, for this uh, excellent um, overview over the book. Uh, it's just a teaser. There's a lot in the book, a lot of details that you had to uh, uh, skip across. So hopefully we can get into some of that in the, uh, the Q&A. Now, uh, our next uh, speaker who will serve as sort of the formal commentator uh, to uh, uh, in this session and who will launch us into a discussion of the book is uh, really a household name in space history circles. Uh, and uh, a leading scholar um, of the Soviet space program. Uh, Dr. Siddiqui is professor of history at Fordham University in New York. Um, Asif is the author of a number of books and articles on the history of space flight, including The Red Rocket's Glare, Space Flight and the Soviet Imagination, 1857 to 1957, published uh, by Cambridge in 2010. And he's currently working on a book entitled Departure Gates, 
Post-Colonial Histories of Space on Earth, under contract with MIT Press, a book that explores the displacement and violence caused by the ground infrastructure built across the post-colonial world to support spaceflight activities during the Cold War. He will be a visiting fellow at the Davis Center for Historical Studies at Princeton University in the 21-22 academic year. Uh, we're happy to have had him involved in a number of uh, history and public policy programs slash Cold War National History uh, project activities at the Wilson Center. He uh, was part, has been part of a number of events. Most recently, uh, he selected, curated, and annotated a new collection on Yuri Gagarin, the Soviet cosmonaut who became the first human to travel into space on April 12, 1961. This as part of the histories History and Public Policy Program's digital archive accessible to any and all of you at digitalarchive.org, where you'll also find links to our sources and methods blog. With that, Asif, the Zoom room is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christian. And thank you, Eric, uh, for inviting me. I hope you can hear me. Um, I, I just want to show the book because I don't know if people seeing, uh, have seen the book. A pretty awesome looking book. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So thanks for inviting me here to speak on this book. I, I have to say it's a bit of a daunting task since this, um, it, this, uh, you know, very beautifully written, thought provoking book uh, and innovative book uh, demands more than just 10 minutes, but I'll try to summarize some of my thoughts here. So um, this book is obviously about the Apollo moon landings, but it's also a book um, that circles around Apollo, I think. And what I mean by that is more than any uh, book about Apollo, it tells us a lot about how Apollo uh, was given meaning above and beyond its considerable technological achievement. Uh, in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's a valuable book for historians of so and sociologists of science and technology who are interested in how uh, science and technology in society transcend their particular specifics and become uh, you know, difficult to dis disentangle from the worlds they emerge from and then the world they helped create. Uh, Teasel's Apollo story just does just that. It wrests Apollo from its sort of, you know, notional story of technology and hardware and locates it in a larger discussion of America's relationship with the rest of the world at the height of the Cold War. Uh, and, and of course, Apollo's particular and specific achievement shouldn't be diminished. You know, it was quite obviously extraordinary to send human beings to land uh, and then walk on another celestial body. But as Teasel expertly shows, Apollo's achievement was uh, inextricably intertwined with US foreign relations. And in particular, the image that America or more pre precisely the US government uh, sought to project uh, about itself to the rest of the world. And there are obviously two, maybe two, maybe more broader factors at play here. The first is the ideological battle of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, which Teasel very nicely shows. Uh, and then there's a, a second equally important uh, global process, which she also mentioned just now, this mass, massive and turbulent process of decolonization going on across the so-called third world, where newly independent states were, uh, you know, trying to decide between an array of de developmental models. Uh, as, as many of you probably know, this was the zenith of this sort of, uh, all these models of modernization were thrown out by Walter Rostow and these kinds of people about how to modernize the third world. Uh, and these independent states saw, um, um, you know, sort of modernization would be an antidote to poverty, but it would also be an antidote modernization theory to socialism or communism. And so there was a kind of a lot at stake in what the third world would take up. And so from the American perspective, Apollo became an instrument to position American values of capitalism, democracy, innovation as the ideal model. And now this was not an easy sell. Many in the developing world and indeed in the non-aligned movement saw the United States as at best an ambiguous force in global affairs. Uh, there was a perception that America, United States of America had meddled in the affairs of many different nations, um, you know, Iran and, Guatemala and Indonesia, uh, Chile, etc. And of course, the most important was Vietnam. And that threatened to overshadow the more benign and humanitarian spirit of American uh, aid uh, through uh, 
agricultural aid or the work of the Peace Corps or USAID and so forth, or even the private philanthropy of, uh, you know, the Ford and Rockefeller foundations. Um, so many anti-colonial movements and then eventually post-colonial na uh, nations saw socialism as a force for progressive and equitable development uh, in this particular context, uh, having been you know, gutted by centuries of colonialism. And so the question might have been asked, what had America to offer in this equation with its persistent problems of uh, race, uh, inequality, urban decay, and assassinations, and social unrest, and so forth. And yet, as, as Teasel so, shows remarkably through all of this, Amer Apollo uh, remained a consistent beacon of American goodwill. Um, undoubtedly, space exploration, um, you know, also evoked a kind of utopianism. Uh, it literally transcended borders. It suggested movement uh, forward and upward. But more than that, Apollo, the Apollo landings represented something very few, I think, scientific and technical endeavors ever do. It was both national and global in meaning. And I think Teasel shows beautifully in this book why hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions globally, understood Apollo as a, a singular achievement that was both American and yet universal at the same time. Um, it was an achievement that mobilized hope and aspiration globally, but people understood it was also American. And that's, that's a very fine line to thread, and she does this very nicely in this story. Um, and, but she also shows us that this was not an accident, that this was a result of a deliberate and very expensive initiative that involved many participants from NASA, uh, the State Department, uh, the US Information Agency, and many other instruments of American statecraft and global power. There are efforts in films, exhibitions, books, pamphlets, uh, uh, posters, and so on for, you know, stickers. Uh, they, all of this stuff, which sounds kind of trivial, had a considerable impact on, on the world over, I think. And, and this impact is hard to measure uh, in any tangible way, but although the US government did try, as Teasel shows us in this book, they, they did spend a lot of money to take surveys of various places of perceptions of American uh, global standing in many different countries. Uh, but as I said, it, it, the whole, uh, this whole the project was framed as uniquely American and yet simultaneously global. It was for humanity, and of humanity too at the same time. And I think, uh, I think a tribute really to how uh, um, this, uh, these conglomerations of agencies were able to do that. Um, and so, so this particular contribution of this book, threading between the national and the global, the way in which Teasel's story travels from you know, a somewhat well-known political story of the machinations behind Apollo, the presidents, the politicians like Johnson, the system builders like James Webb and the rocket designers uh, like Von Braun, uh, but also State Department civil actors. Uh, she takes this story and then just rests it and locates it, locates it within a broader international story. Uh, the incredible and rich detail that Teasel adds to this story is amazing. And um, for those I re you know, who read this book, you'll, as you turn from page to page, you'll go from Washington DC to Lagos, to Bombay, to Madagascar, to Tokyo, to Rome. It's really a, a kind of travelogue. It's really superb in that sense. I, and I think it's really the first attempt to write what I think of as, uh, although she calls it a political history of Project Apollo, I think this is also a, a kind of a global history of Apollo in that sense. So I think for that alone, this is a singular achievement. Um, and there's, there's uh, what I also love about the book is there's a big picture, but also lovely granular, granular detail of exhibitions for John Glenn spacecraft, of astronauts who went on trips uh, uh, to across the globe. Uh, also really insightful and interesting uh, excerpts from uh, many, many local newspapers across the world of what they were writing about Apollo, which is something I've never really seen. Uh, and also controversies. This was not a you know, a rose garden, lots of uh, clashes and conflicts and flashpoints we see uh, in places in Africa and so forth, uh, and concerns about the positioning of American tracking stations in places like um, uh, Madagascar and South Africa and uh, so uh, many other places in Mexico. Uh, methodologically, I also think this is interesting. She does uh, a really impressive high wire act, which only a few, I think, have really done, which is to connect the political, 
managerial and technological dimensions of Apollo with the cultural, which Tiesel calls the cultural status of science and technology. Like many others, uh, she doesn't see these stories as separate. To really understand and recover the history of the moon landings, she asks us to accept and concede that what was happening um, in lunar orbit or on the surface of the moon was as important as what was happening you know, when NASA astronauts flew to Paraguay, which Neil Armstrong and Dick Gordon did in 1966. And there's a video of it on YouTube somewhere. Uh, they traveled to uh, a bunch of Europe, uh, South American countries, I think 11 uh, in October of 66 as ambassadors of American science and technology. And this is all one part of, of a larger narrative that I think has only been told piecemeal. So I wanna seg you, I, wanna, I don't wanna go on too long, but I wanna seg uh, segue a little bit quickly to something personal, which, uh, and then conclude uh, with some questions. The personal part is really that um, uh, the book that Tiesel has written has actually deep personal resonance to me. And this is something I've talked to Tiesel about before. This is my, one of my first memories as a child was as, a, as you know, like a three, four year old, uh, I, I'm dating myself here very much, but in the fall of 1969, when I was a toddler and my father took me to see the motorcade of, of Apollo 11, the crew, as they arrived in Dhaka, Bangladesh, which at the time was East Pakistan. Uh, obviously, I don't remember much about much about it, but I do. I have this frame in my head of the astronauts are flying by in their uh, car, uh, which was an open, like uh, didn't have a covers, and they were waving. Um, and I was sitting on my father's shoulder, but both of us waving and thousands of people cheering and that sort of thing. But more important than the memory itself, which is sort of frozen in my head, uh, is my father's repeated reference to that experience as I was growing up. He would excitedly talk about seeing the Apollo 11 astronauts in person with a kind of joy that was very difficult to measure by any survey or anything really. And that experience, I think talking to my father as I grew up really was really defining for me that sort of global unity. I, I don't know what else to call it. That was often a corrective to moments of cynicism, if you will, about global politics and what have you. Um, and, and as an aside, I have to say that I, I, had, a, I had the fortune of corresponding with Neil Armstrong uh, a little bit over email. And uh, I did tell him about that incident. And he wrote back uh, and he said uh, this one sentence, seldom if ever have I seen such enthusiasm on the part of the crowds watching the motorcade you remembered. <laughs> I'm sure that was probably made up, but it ne nevertheless, it was a nice thing to get. Uh, and one last thing is, as I, as I was growing up in Dhaka, two doors down from us was the United States Information Service, which Tiesel also mentions in her book, the USIS, which were the centers produced by the USIA across the world, uh, United States Information Agency. And Tiesel actually tells us that by 1960, there were already 200 of these stations in 98 countries across the world. And they had libraries and collections. And as a kid, I remember visiting the USIS near our house and noticing the proliferation of space imagery, even though it's not a space library or anything, there were pictures of astronauts and shuttles and so on and so forth. And they encouraged me to write to NASA and I did uh, as a kid and <laughs> NASA sent me lots of packages and things like that. So sort of, I, I guess I wanna reflect on the fact that I myself am a kind of small example of the implications of the kind of story that Teasel has put together, that there are in fact personal stories behind this incredible and thought provoking narrative presented in this book. Uh, that is at its heart about, you know, hundreds of thousands of real people much like me. So. Um, I want to end there, but I want to, I'm going to throw out a few questions if that's okay with Tiesel also. So um, yeah, these are sort of questions that, you know, I've been wondering for a long time, but I thought more about as I was reading your book, um, you know, this, the project of positioning Apollo as reflective of American values that, you know, that was the project of the State Department, maybe in the 60s, you talked about liberal democracy and so forth. Uh, do you see this uh, as a pragmatic exercise, uh, like a cynical exercise, or do you see this for something else? And you know, I, I, I've often wondered, like, as historians, I'm not necessarily trying to cast judgment on it, but is it a one can see it in a cynical way that this is uh, the packaging of Apollo, something that's hugely expensive and maybe justifying it? And there are historians who've made that argument uh, about you know, selling the moon and these sorts of stuff. So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, but why don't we go yeah. straight to Teasel now? And I'd, yeah, I'd, sure. We'd like the back and forth by the time we get to number three, people will have sure. forgotten about your first question. So <laughs> sure. let's let's have Teasel respond right away and then we can go back to USC for your next question. Sure. 
Well, just thank you so much for the the comments. That's so uh, flattering and wonderful to hear, and and also for sharing your personal story. I I will say that one of the um, one of the great things about this project has been traveling around the world and sharing my research with people and then having them tell me their own stories. It's, uh, it's been quite remarkable. And um, I've been to almost every continent where people have their stories to tell. And, and also people who have been reading this book have been reaching out to me and telling me their stories, which is really fun when they saw the astronauts or an exhibit. So um, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, your, so your question about uh, the reflection of American values in these um, in the space program. So um, I, I would say it's it's a combination of things in the early discussions about you know, what kind of goal the United States should choose when it came to finding an, an impressive program that. Uh, a program that promises dramatic results that we can win. Um, some of the commentary was that a, a program like Apollo was going to be um, a, a demonstration of the industrial capacity of the nation. And in some ways, that's a, a demonstration of the, the strengths of capitalism. Um, and uh, that was so that was sort of essential to the initial sort of rationale and motivation for the program. But one of the things that I've always found um, somewhat odd about this uh, decision to pursue space exploration um, to demonstrate American values or Soviet values is that both the United States and the Soviet Union um, invested in space exploration as a way to differentiate um, uh, themselves from the other uh, superpower, um, but yet they were choosing very similar goals and, and very similar techniques. Um, and so it is somewhat strange that the United States didn't choose to pursue um, a different type of program to demonstrate American values and um, to make it very clear that they were different than Soviet values. Uh, initially, Kennedy was interested in something like the desalination of water. He was interested in something that would have more direct um, impact on the lives of people around the world. And, and that might have, um, things might have turned out differently. Um, so, uh, it was part of the discussion. It, it's sort of um, an odd part of this history, but I will also note that um, early on uh, with the Soviet Union was exhibit or had um, cosmonauts travel the world, as you know. Um, and so the United States really focused on things like sending spacecraft abroad. And the idea was that um, sending hardware, sending the technology uh, was going to um, demonstrate American values of openness, also the decision to to invite um, journalists to cover launches and to be very public about all aspects of the mission. Now, that was supposed to be a demonstration of um, the United States or even the, um, the idea to send astronauts abroad. They were supposed to demonstrate the um, uh, sort of ideal American as, uh, as some presidents um, saw them. So um, it's this it's a it's a it's an odd mix of things and, and in some ways it's it's in direct response to what the Soviet Union was doing and so the it's not just a reflection of an idea of an American values it's in opposition to um, the Soviet Union sort of uh, defining American values in opposition to the Soviet Union um, uh, so it's it's a mixture of things I think it's a it's a complicated part of the story um, uh, and it's a it's a great question there's sort of a lot there Thank you. Back to you, Asif. Yeah, I just want to add something. I mean, this is something you know, Tiesel, uh, because we probably talked about it, is that, um, you know, Apollo is, uh, sorry, that the, the notion of Apollo representing, you know, liberal democracy and American values and even capitalism is, is, is somewhat, uh, you know, uh, strikingly uh, interesting because, uh, of course, the Apollo program is one is a large centralized federally mandated program running through NASA. It's basically, I mean, nowadays, if anything like that happened, it's socialism, you know, it's sort of like this sort of big, uh, there's like one person at the top and so forth. Whereas, as, as you also know, in the Soviet Union, their space program in the 60s was particularly chaotic and people competing against each other in terms of design bureaus and all this other stuff, which had some sort of semblance of maybe capitalism. I wouldn't go far as far as to call it capitalism. But the irony is, of course, that these two systems, at least in the 60s, operated in almost mirror image kind of uh, tradition. So yeah, I think that's, so I, I, I guess, you know, as I was thinking, reading your book, uh, you know, where does the capitalism step in into in terms of a, a Apollo project? Because there are companies involved, you know, Boeing and Grumman and whoever, but is that emphasized in the literature on Apollo that, you know, this, these are large 
companies like, uh, and there's innovation and competition, or is it emphasized that this is all NASA? And I, I wanted to maybe tease out that in, in how's the literature advertising it? So the, the emphasis in the overseas programming is definitely on NASA um, and, and the United States more generally, but um, sort of this idea of American capitalism comes into play because space exhibits were extremely popular. And one way to ensure that you would get an audience at your exhibits or other events uh, was to have some space related aspect and then something else. And so um, the US Information Agency actually used the popularity of, of spaceflight to then promote other things. So um, American industry, for instance. So you'd have exhibits on both topics um, and it was a way to draw people in. Um, there were other there were other things covered, but um, the role of uh, private industry was really um, not emphasized as much as you might expect. And I, and I think it's worth noting that uh, over 90% of the people that worked on the Apollo program were contractors and subcontractors. They were not NASA employees and uh, between 80 and 90% of funding that went to NASA was actually um, ended up within private industry. So um, it's a huge part of how Apollo got done, but it wasn't a big part of the messaging internationally. I, yeah, and I think also just one last comment on this, that uh, I think, uh, well, two things. One, the, the fact that there was actually, I mean, Apollo is really kind of a public-private partnership if you want to really go disentangle it. Because people talk about the dawn of commercial space flight now, but it was already happening in the 60s, just in a slightly different form. But the second comment is, is uh, to use uh, the business school speak is that the branding of NASA, right? NASA as a brand is so powerful, so incredible. I, I think many companies would kill to have that kind of brand name recognition that NASA has, but yet it's a federal agency. It emerged at a time of the Cold War, uh, very state, it's associated with statecraft and so forth. So I think there's a kind of interesting uh, story and contradiction in there about the branding of NASA. But I think that branding was done in the stories that you tell, right? All these exhibitions, all these uh, trips branded NASA as something innovative, forward thinking, dynamic. So I think that's really great. Thank you. I see. Um, I won't let you off uh, without at least saying a word about the Soviet reaction uh, to all of this. But while you um, sort that out, let me remind our viewers that there are three ways you can participate in the discussion right after uh, this initial uh, uh, exchange. You can, uh, that's how, what we would uh, prefer. You can use the raise hand function and we'll actually dial you into this conversation. You can use the Q&A function at the top or bottom of your screen to post your question and then uh, I'll read it to uh, our panelists. Uh, or if you're watching us on Facebook Live, um, please email Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. Asif, a final note on the Soviet side? Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I mean, there is a there was a considerable Soviet effort to, um, you know, advertise or publicize their space program, and it uh, it really ramps up uh, into like an extra gear right after the flight of Yuri Gagarin. And in fact, um, in preparation for this, I was looking through some Soviet archival documents, and there's a literally a document about a, a few days after Gagarin, uh, basically a huge decree saying that we should start publishing books, uh, photographs, and albums for the foreign market, right? Uh, and, and principally the, the, the audience, the theater of operations is the third world as they're understanding it. And so they implement this incredible project that includes sending cosmonauts abroad. So they go repeatedly almost every year, they do these immense tours uh, to advertise the space program. And there's a huge publishing project under Progress Publishers, which is a domestic imprint, but it's in English and they just distribute these books free of charge globally. Uh, but they're hampered, and the Tiesel hinted at this, by the fact of uh, military secrecy. They can't show the spacecraft. So what they can show is the person. So they send out the cosmonauts. Uh, so it's a very, it's actually kind of different in terms. So I think uh, Tiesel is right that there's something about showing the, ob the artifact, the object that went into space uh, that is uh, quite uh, enthralling to audiences, in addition to seeing the astronauts. Uh, but uh, devoid of the artifact, the, ask, the cosmonaut himself or, or herself was uh, had, a, had a different kind of effect. But they did try quite, and up to the 1970s, they were constantly sending cosmonauts abro abroad as part of a major program that they invested lots of money in. Thank you. Um, 
Let me uh, uh, perhaps start with additional questions. I know Eric has, has um, one and we'll go to a number of questions in the Q&A. Uh, Teasel, just, I think it's always good. This is a, the Washington History Seminar. We're in the post-fact era now. I think it's good to remind our viewers, not all of whom are historians, we hope, uh, that historians um, uh, uh, base their um, findings on archives and documents and evidence. Uh, could you talk for just a moment about um, the materials you used? Um, you already hinted at uh, the, the materials at the National uh, Archives, but you uh, did a lot more work and maybe there are sort of one or two findings that just sort of uh, jump out in, in looking back uh, at you, kind of smoking guns or uh, documents or something like that, some fun finds. Sure, and the archival research is perhaps my favorite part of being a historian. Um, and I spent a uh, majority of my time at the National Archives in College Park um, in the USIA and State Department materials. And there was just an incredible wealth of material that um, I have I have not seen any pub, you know described in any other um, books. So some of the reports have have gotten into books, but there's a huge wealth of information um, in that material, far more than I was able to include in my book. Um, and so uh, I did a lot of research there. The presidential archives, some personal papers. Um, I did a lot of oral histories, uh, which was a huge huge benefit of doing some somewhat recent history. So um, the Apollo astronauts and um, fascinating conversations about how they understood their role as diplomats and um, how how aware and attuned they were to um, their role within the, the larger Cold War, um, especially people like Frank Borman, um, really fascinating conversations. And then I was also um, able to interview uh, people, other contributors to um, space, space flight diplomacy. So a science advisor of the USIA and um, an exhibit designer, and then traveling internationally, um, getting to do some research in international archives was really, really helpful to filling out the story and understanding sort of um, some of these these exhibits and events and um, coverage of the Apollo program as um, as more of a partnership uh, as opposed to the U.S. just sending things out um, and understanding the the local role in the experience and and what mo might motivate um, institutions abroad. So one example is um, doing research um, in the Science Museum in London, where many of the spacecraft were put on exhibit and internal correspondence there was about, you know, um, the importance of developing this relationship with NASA with this hope that they would might maybe get a spacecraft permanently long term, because that'd be great for the museum. Um, so there, there was uh, some some sort of local motivation in, in that interaction. And um, uh, another a really wonderful conversation I had was an, with an artist in, in Japan, and he was actually quite critical of the Apollo program, but he did this great piece um, inspired by the collection of lunar samples. He went to a riverbed in Japan and um, collected uh, rocks from the riverbed um, and, and made a point that it's the land art piece that he did and made a point of saying that earth rocks are as important as moon rocks. But um, having a conversation with him about what that meant and, and that experience in Japan was quite influential, added, I think, a lot of nuance to my understanding of um, the Apollo program. Great, thank you. Over to Eric. Thanks, Christian. Uh, Teasel, this is an incredibly engaging book and you were just scratching the surface of, of many of the things that are in it. I am struck by by an issue um, uh, about assessing the impact of this public diplomacy. Um, and you state at the outset, and it's a theme that repeats, that that one of the driving factors behind the Apollo program and uh, what you call space space flight spectaculars and their production abroad um, was the the winning over of international public opinion and countering anti-American sentiment. And I'm reminded in reading this of Mary Dudziak's work uh, on Cold War civil rights, which makes an appearance in this book about just what a headache um, the terrible American civil rights scene or race relations scene, uh, scene um, had on our diplomats uh, and, and uh, others abroad um, and that they had to sell and a, a story you know, to, to the world, um, a story that's really quite negative, but they had to kind of put a positive spin on it. Here, they're using something positive, but with a very, very, very big price tag, as you make abundantly clear, uh, in a world in which 
the civil rights scene in the United States is still terrible, progress notwithstanding, and the Vietnam War seems to, I don't know, um, tar America's reputation in a lot of places. So at the end of the day, when you think about the price tag uh, of the Apollo program with these public diplomacy aims in mind, do civil rights and Vietnam make it impossible uh, for these folks to genuinely succeed. It might be one thing to kind of appreciate um, the global community or the scientific achievement or even the American spirit, but at the same time, still come away thinking that with regard to race, the United States is not living up to its ideals and in the realm of Vietnam, OMG. Um, uh, this is this is not a, a positive. So I'm just wondering about the price tag and the result, given the reality, the backdrop. I think that's a great and challenging question. Um, I when when assessing the the cost involved in Apollo, I think it's important to um, compare it to something like the Vietnam War because I think they had in some ways a similar goal of, of containment of um, sort of confronting the, the challenge of uh, the Soviet Union's uh, potential influence um, on countries around the world and, and US geopolitical power more generally. So um, if you if you think of Apollo in those terms, so um, as soft power as opposed to the hard power, but a similar type of objective, um, perhaps it's a bargain <laughs> because uh, it's, Apollo is not often referred to as a bargain, but it's, it's $25 billion. And by the late 1960s, that's how much the United States was spending on the Vietnam War per year. Um, so uh, the, the scale of the expenses is, um, or the different scale of expense is actually quite extraordinary, but you raise a, a wonderful point about civil rights and other domestic issues within the United States. And I think um, a lot of the um, very serious critique of Apollo is related to that. Um, why is a nation investing in sending humans to the moon when there are so many problems on earth? A lot of that critique happened within the United States, but there was some of it um, internationally as well. And I think um, one of the things that we have to do is um, evaluate Apollo as a primarily foreign relations program. Um, so um, the question becomes, should the United States be investing in foreign relations programs um, uh, at that moment? Um, but then it also, I think it is important to point out this context that um, the United States' role in Vietnam and civil rights struggles really limited the potential impact of Apollo and um, uh, American foreign affairs officers were reporting that back um, to Washington saying there's only so much that Apollo can do and the popularity of Apollo can do. And um, when we have these issues in the United States, we can't um, expect that the space program is going to um, uh, just chrome plate over them. There are more serious issues. So um, the idea that a program like Apollo um, could, could solve all the problems of the United States at the time, I don't think anyone thought that. Um, whether or not it was the most effective use of, of funds, I think that that's a that's a fair question. It's hard to answer, um, but I do think it also should be evaluated in terms of um, foreign relations programs of the day, as opposed to um, uh, domestic initiatives. But I guess you can you can obviously evaluate all of those together. So it's a challenging question. I don't have a a, a short answer to, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to add a quick note to say that this was the the domestic situation in the United States, particularly with civil rights, was actually one of the issues uh, quite uh, invoked in Soviet media constantly that, uh, oh, they're spending uh, billions of dollars on space when they have all these racial problems. And there was particularly uh, um, with the uh, with the in 1957 with the Little Rock uh, nine teenagers who were uh, segregated in school and this, these stories were very much amplified in the Soviet press. And of course, Vietnam was a huge presence in Soviet newspapers, but the link was often made between uh, the wastefulness of Apollo and the fact that uh, domestically, uh, there were all these problems in America. So I think this was played up very much in the Soviet media. Thank you. Let's go to Randy Lieberman, who's um, raised his hand to ask a question. If, you're, if you could please unmute yourself. Yes, you thank you. Cecil, I look forward to reading your book. And, and obviously in the 20 odd minutes that you've had a chance to speak, 
you can only uh, scratch the surface of this somewhat uh, complicated issue. Um, but forecasting into the future, if, if you can, I like the idea of peering into a crystal ball and, and making predictions. So Tiesel, if I can put it on you, uh, if you buy into the belief that presently the United States and China are winding into a fairly aggressive great power competition and space is one manifestation of this, how do you think this is going to play out in terms of public diplomacy, uh, domestically US, domestically China, and China trying to sell the, the world and the US trying to sell the world uh, on, on our technical accomplishments. The China, Chinese with Belt and Road, the US uh, seemingly making uh, better relations with uh, the U European Union again, post Trump. And I've said enough, please take it away, Tiesel. Thank you for your question. It's um, another challenging question. I uh, I often get asked about sort of contemporary versions of the space race and um, potential space race between the United States and and China, and then there are other ones too: space competitions between um, uh, private industry and um, there's the Asian space race, which um, Asif has written about. Um, and I. I think it's really important to recognize the um, the very unique particular context of um, the 1960s. And I think this is part of the reason why I think um, uh, decolonization is an important part of the Apollo story. And it's, um, and it's important to focus on how that factored into the motivations um, of the United States and the Soviet Union, as well as how things played out in terms of the um, uh, public diplomacy um, programming and and the designs of those programs and so I think that the context today is is extraordinarily different um, and it's not that to say that it couldn't there couldn't be aspects like that um, in the future but I think that the the state of the world at that time when there was the the potential for really influencing the the shape of the, the social political systems of new countries. Um, you don't see that today so much. I mean, there might be um, a smaller potential number of instances where that could be the case, but um, part of what was essential to the space race in the 1960s was this expectation that spaceflight had the potential to change society um, and change particular societies around the world that both the United States and the, and the Soviet Union were interested in aligning with um, in a, in a larger sort of mission of um, uh, of, of global power. Um, so, I think just to say, I think it's quite different today. Um, there there might be some motivation for for competition, but um, I think it's a different situation. And it would be really useful if we start talking about um, the relationship between the Chinese space program and the U.S. Um, space program in a in a slightly different way. Thank you. Um, we'll go next to Michael Binder. Michael Binder, please unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, I'm Michael Binder, program manager with the Air Force Declassification Office. My question is about how America's captivation with the space program ended just about three years after we first got to the moon. Was there anything that could have been done to maintain the excitement. It seems like it took something like the space shuttle to get the American public interested again. Thanks for your question, because it, it and it really it brings up an important point, I think, which is that um, the Apollo program actually wasn't that popular domestically within the United States, except for uh, this period of time just around the first lunar landing. So throughout most of the, the 1960s, it was not that that popular, less than 50% of Americans thought it was um, something that the United States government should be investing in. Um, and it was really just around the first lunar landing. Um, it was popular abroad for, for much longer um, and there was more enthusiasm, but, but a very limited popularity within the United States. Um, when it came to the impact internationally, there was this idea that that would wane and that the additional missions would not draw as much attention. So there was a lot of awareness at the time that 
you know, uh, achieving a first is, is something and they're going to expect a bigger audience for that. Um, uh, so they were prepared for that and they, they tried to sort of amplify the interest and enthusiasm and sort of buoy it for as long as possible. But um, they, they were aware that that, that um, was, had limited, you know, uh, um, staying power. Um, there was and has been critique within the space community, I believe, that setting a goal like Apollo, something so grand, so dramatic and, and, and not that sustainable in terms of national investment, it was somewhat problematic for the space program because um, it it gave people a lot of hope for what could be achieved and expectation that um, the United States would be sending humans to, to Mars uh, more quickly um, and, and other types of goals. And so in comparison to Apollo, there's, there's been a sense of, you know, uh, why haven't we been back? And um, a, a slight disappointment, I think, for many people, which has, which has um, factored into, I think, um, Americans relationship to the space program more generally, but, um, perhaps that is changing now with, uh, with new missions. Thank you. We have a question posted by Ted Gordon, the chief engineer of Douglas's third stage of Apollo. How does your book deal with von Braun's role? Diesel. Yes. Well, um, very little, actually. Um, I, I talk a bit about his role in terms of setting the goal for Apollo because he was really essential um, in that. And um, but he didn't make a major appearance when it came to um, international public diplomacy material. Um, uh, there was some promotion of his role within uh, West Germany and programming um, targeting German audiences. This, the same was true of people who contributed to Apollo who um, were originally from other countries. Uh, they were they became important part of the Apollo story um, in the information programming in those respective countries. Um, but it it didn't factor in too much. I think um, there was limited awareness during this time or um, a limited interest on the part of the U.S. government to to talk much about his uh, longer history and problematic um, role within the Nazi Party. Thank you. Um, uh, again, uh, we we um, really would love to have your questions directly through uh, uh, the raise hand function. So please use that. We'll go to John Martin next. You were muted there for a minute, for a moment. There you go. Uh, Teasel, I'm a retired journalist and a research fellow at the Wilson Center. Your book sounds terrific and, a, and your archival work sounds especially interesting. I just wonder, can you step back from that now and tell me how much impact in keeping the American program going was John Kennedy's charisma, if any? Kennedy has a very interesting relationship to the Apollo program. And um, I, I think it's worth noting that he on multiple occasions tried to pursue a cooperative program with the Soviet Union. He was skeptical about the expense of spaceflight, although he did support the Apollo program throughout his um, presidency. He was, he was skeptical of the cost. Um, and uh, his charisma was really important um, at certain at certain moments, especially when it came to getting the country more behind the mission, I think. Um, and a great example of that is his speech at Rice University, which is his most famous space speech, I would I would say about we choose to go to the moon. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the way he delivered it and the people he had working for him um, that that uh, wrote that speech together. Um, uh, really did have an impact. Um, it was, it's a great speech, especially if you think of it as sort of like a, um, sort of a, like a pep rally almost. It, uh, it was, it was uh, delivered at Rice University at a Stadium and it really has that kind of, we're behind, but we can, you know, on the second inning we can, or whatever the space analogy is, we can, uh, we can beat them in the end. Um, so I think he was, his charisma was really important in that regard. Um, but I, 
I would say that um, it's also really essential to look at the role of Lyndon Johnson and how important he was to ensuring um, general political support of the Apollo program through that period and then after Kennedy passed away as well. But he worked very closely with Congress to make sure that um, they would support this expensive um, program. So a lot a lot of the sort of the credit of Apollo um, should should go to Lyndon Johnson. Thank you. Um, next, we'll go to Ellie Co. Hello, um, I was actually an intern at the History and Public Policy Program last year with you, and it's great yep. to have the chance to be back here. Yes. Um, so this question is, um, how exactly did the USIA overcome co cultural differences in its use of Apollo and public diplomacy? And were there any memorable instances of culture clash or misunderstandings? Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Oh, that's a good question. I'm just racking my brain for, for the right answer. I will say that um, uh, the USAA tried to work closely with um, uh, individuals within respect in various countries to ensure that the programming would be targeted as much as possible for those audiences. And so one example of that is they, um, NAS actually worked with the USIA. They had a space mobile program, which is sort of like a library on wheels, a, a, a vehicle that had space exhibits and um, had space lectures. And, and NASA employees would travel with these um, space mobiles, but then they would train local lecturers um, to be the, the, the space lecturer in countries. And so um, they worked really closely um, with, with people in various countries around the world. And that helped some of the sort of the refinement, fine tuning of the program. And, um, uh, and they made sure to try to connect local and local culture to American space exploration as much as possible. So in, in speeches and in programming, a lot of um, examples from individual locations around the world reflect local history. Um, the astronauts did that when they traveled abroad as well. So um, there was a lot of effort and work that went into um, uh, connecting American spaceflight to particular locations. Um, and I can't off the top of my head think of any examples where um, it was really, uh, there was a big uh, backlash or it was problematic. So um, I'll keep thinking, um, but I can't, nothing comes to mind. Thank you. Great uh, question from James Green. Does Lewis Mumford um, figure in Operation Moonglow? The critic of technological gigantism um, which distracted from management of Earth's resources. He doesn't, and um, uh, I, 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 maybe if I had had more time, he he would have. I will say that um, in doing research in the, the USIA material, I did. I was happy to, to come across the uh, sort of documents related to um, publication of his work and its distribution internationally um, uh, as part of the promotion of um, American ideas abroad. Um, but he, he does not factor in, into my book though, no. Thank you. Maria Shen, a producer and writer has a question. In 1957, the Sputnik news in October knocked off the little Rock Nine Teenagers Desegregation News from the front page of the New York Times for the first time since early September. Did you come across the civil rights struggles during your research, specifically the Little Rock Nine? Um, yeah, it's a great question. There is an important relationship between American civil rights struggles and the space program. Um, and it comes up in a number of different ways at different points. Um, part of the reason that, that Lyndon Johnson uh, really made a point of uh, focusing on uh, Sputnik and um, critiquing the Eisenhower administration um, was because this expectation that civil rights were going to be an issue that was going to be really problematic for the Democratic Party. And in order to get um, uh, people elected in the fall, it was going to be important for the Democrats to focus on another issue, critique um, uh, the Republican uh, Party and the Eisenhower administration um, when it came to, to national security. And so um, it was a way to sort of deflect some attention away from um, civil rights. It, uh, it was uh, 
uh, an issue that came up, especially in, in the public diplomacy and programming focused um, on Africa. And um, the, the US actually sent African American lecturers to lecture on the space program um, uh, in African countries as a way to demonstrate and sort of counteract this narrative of um, American civil rights struggle. So they were supposed to bring these dual messages of, um, of optimism of space flight and the opportunities within the United States. And so um, there are a number of areas where civil rights and the space program intersect when it comes to foreign relations. And in addition to this, there's a really um, inc increasingly rich literature now on um, the relationship between civil rights and space flight domestically. Thank you very much. Um, we have an anonymous attendee posting the following question. I thought it was really interesting that the moon landing was thought of as a global event at the time because I've always associated it with the Cold War and somewhat of a nationalist act. Is my perception from a Generation Z individual common? And if so, what do you think led to it? Uh, interesting question. I will say, um, Oh, uh, one of the pleasures of this project is traveling internationally and um, uh, people that I meet who are over, um, let's say, 55 or so have uh, a, a memory and experience of the first lunar landing that they share with me and an incredible number do and um, talk about it as part of their personal history or talk about it as you know part of their national history too and the events that were going on locally. And I'll also uh, point out with the 50th anniversary of the moon landing in 2019, there were celebrations held around the world um, marking the occasion. It wasn't just something that was celebrated in the United States. And so I think that for many people in many places, this is part of global history um, uh, and perhaps um, especially now in some of the conversations about uh, the United States returning to the moon, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, the United States hasn't been to the moon since 1972, uh, we're gonna do it again. And so and so maybe that, that adds more of a sort of national focus to, um, or sort of lens to the event. But from my experience from, from 1969 and, and the years following immediately after that, and then also interacting with people who uh, were alive during that time, it, um, there was this huge sense that it, this, was, this, was a, this was something that the world participated in together. Thank you. Um, yet another anonymous attendee asks, did you find any contingency plans for public relations if the mission had failed? There were contingency plans um, and there were contingency plans if uh, Soviet missions failed as well. So instructions on on how the president should speak about um, Soviet failure if that if that were to happen, you know, um, uh, that with a very, very sort of uh, political um, angle to them. But uh, the probably the most notable one is uh, that if the um, the first lunar landing had failed, um, what what the president should say, and that was a speech that was um, was written out ahead of time, um, so the, the president was prepared um, and uh, to read that, and then also what he should do in terms of interacting with um, the astronauts' wives and families. Um, so there was some idea of of what to do, and I. I think it's worth noting and bringing up the, the case of the um, Apollo 1 fire, which was um, the horrible accident. It killed the crew um, of, of um, the mission on the launch pad during a test. And um, there was uh, actually quite a bit of surprise initially um, within the US government that um, there was an outpouring of, of, of warmth and empathy um, from people around the world for that accident. There was some concern that that type of failure uh, would be seen as you know um, something that should be critiqued about the United States, but the, the decision to be very open about it um, was actually responded to in a, in a relatively positive way. And in, in, um, this idea that the US was taking the world into its confidence and um, and so that was that was just a, another example of this kind of um, ways that sort of thinking about accidents factored into um, the foreign relation aspects of Apollo. Great, thank you. Uh, David Rabinovitz asks, Apollo and the space program in general drove and funded a lot of technological spin-offs which have had major impact on modern life. Did you consider these collateral impacts of the program? <laughs> <laughs> 
my book's all about the political spinoffs of Apollo, and and that's what I emphasize. Um, and uh, there's a section that I didn't talk about today because I ran out of time, but. Um, the, the book takes its title from Operation Moonglow, which is, was Nixon's uh, diplomatic tour of Southeast Asia um, after the mission. And so he met the astronauts at Splashdown and um, saw it as a great opportunity to, um, uh, to introduce the Nixon doctrine to um, travel Southeast Asia and talk about um, his new uh, new foreign relations stance for the United States. So looking for ways to end the Vietnam War and to um, uh, improve relations with China. And so there are uh, important political spinoffs and that's that's what I uh, I like to emphasize in my work. Although there are spinoffs for Apollo more generally. And I think probably um, when you're talking about technology, the most notable one is probably the, um, the computer industry and Apollo's R&D. We have a major storm moving into uh, the Washington oh. area. So um, uh, this may happen to several <laughs> of us. Um, fortunately, we're close to the end of our session. And while there were a couple more questions that I would have liked to ask, all of them focused on kind of uh, current, uh, the current relevance of um, uh, the um, Cold War experience especially vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with, uh, with China. Um, uh, Asif, um, final word from you before I turn it over to Eric and um, with regrets to uh, Teasel, who however, uh, you know, fielded a good number of questions in the last hour and a half. Asif, any final words? Yeah. No, I just uh, want to encourage people to read this book. It's a really valuable corrective in many ways to our understanding of Apollo. I learned quite a bit from it. And, uh, I hope one day we see a Soviet version of this too, how they sold their space program. Um, so that would be very interesting. But thank you all for inviting me to contribute. So. Thank you, Asif. Uh, uh, thanks to Teasel. Um, and uh, over to you, Eric, for concluding remarks. All right, well, my thanks as well to Teasel, Asif, and Christian, uh, as well as those of you in the audience, and apologies to those of you whose questions we couldn't get to. We hope to see you all back next week on Monday, June 28th at 4 p.m., when we return to discuss Patricia Sullivan's just published book, Justice Rising, Robert Kennedy's America in Black and White, with commentators Blair Kelly and Kenneth Mack. Till then, my thanks for joining us. Good night, and take care.